in spirit and in truth. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Or as the old King James said, every man. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Solomon penned long ago in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 2, Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Certainly a wonderful reminder of how careful we need to be with what we say. Christianity is a religion that calls for separation from the world. And there are many areas in which we know when we read the Bible that we are to separate ourselves from worldly ways and worldly things. As we studied last Lord's Day, we observed that a Christian is to be, for example, an individual who thinks differently than the world. Recall we mentioned Philippians 2 verse 5 in that lesson. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus obviously thought differently than the world, which is at least part of the reason why they wanted to crucify him. But our mind must be different because Jesus' thinking was different. Also, a Christian is to be an individual that acts differently than the world. In 1 John 2, 15, the Bible urges us, Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so we've got to behave or to act differently than the world, and Lord willing, we will discuss that topic next Lord's Day. But likewise, one of the areas in which a Christian is to be separated from the world is in his or her speech. Paul said to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt word, no corrupt word, proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that you may impart grace to the hearers. Paul also said to the Colossians in Colossians 3 verse 8, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. The world is full of filthy language or corrupt communication as the old King James says. And we as Christians must not allow the world's speech to influence our speech. And I know that is a very challenging idea, not to let the world's speech influence our speech. And so this morning, it's my aim to encourage us as Christians to strive to speak like a Christian. We ought to be different than others in the way that we talk. We ought to be more carefully guarded with what we say because that's how the Bible instructs, instructs Christians to speak. And so this morning, I want us to consider three ways or three ideas that we need to consider in order for us to speak like a Christian. I want to consider in the first place this morning that I need to consider my speech in relationship to the Bible's warnings. I need to consider my speech in relationship to the Bible's warnings. And whether we're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, there has always been something said or some warnings given about the way those who follow God are to speak. And so we observe that, number one, the Old Testament gave a careful consideration to one's speech. We already noticed a little bit of that. In looking at the Ecclesiastes reference in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2. But again, the Old Testament writers gave careful consideration to one's speech. In Proverbs 10 and verse 19, Solomon penned these words, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Well, it just naturally goes 
to be the, or seems to be the case, the more talking that we do, the more likely we are to sin in something that we say. And so there was a warning about, you know, talking too much and using your words very uh, frivolously, not really thinking much about what one says. In Proverbs 13, verse 3, He who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. So there's this idea of, like, you know, setting a guard on your mouth, being very careful with what we say, and, and it ties it to life here. Very interesting. Also in Proverbs 17, verse 27, he who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Whenever I think about that verse, Proverbs 17, 28, I can't help but think about that famous quote by Abraham Lincoln when he said, Better to remain silent and thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. You know, it's, it's interesting how that if we are very carefully guarded, as the Bible has, has shown us, very carefully guarded over what we say, that things tend to turn out better. And fewer words in the Bible are considered better than more words. Also, you think about what uh, Solomon said in Proverbs 29.11. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. The old King James said here, a fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. So again, there's this idea in the Bible presented to us about how our words are to be few and not many, and how we ought to be careful and guard our mouths very carefully in what we say. Then there's the idea of maybe the way we say things, or the, the tone of voice. Which can also be a problem. Children learn that pretty early on. For example, in Proverbs 15, verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. So there's the idea of tone and, and the way we say things. That can also be a problem and cause strife or anger, as Solomon said. Also in verse 2. Proverbs 15 has a lot to say about one's words. In verse 2, he goes on to say, The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Also in verse 4 of Proverbs 15, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. So yes, we can use our speech and our tongues in a way that is good and useful, and, and we've already seen a little bit of that in some of the quotations we saw from Ephesians and Colossians. And then I love the picture that's given to us in Proverbs 25, 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. So there's a beautiful picture of a word that is carefully chosen and used at the right time. And, and how it can be used to encourage someone or build someone up. But again, when we're talking about our speech, and we talk about the warnings the Bible gives, the Bible has always given warnings and attention to how we ought to use our words. Well, of course, it goes without saying. Number two, the New Testament gives careful consideration to one's speech. The letter of James has often been referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. As there's a lot of wisdom in James's letter, those five chapters, and a lot of it is very similar to what we might find Solomon penning. But for example, in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, James said, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, we often say things in anger that we live to regret. But being slow to speak, as James suggests here, and thus being slow to wrath, will help us in our efforts to be careful with our words. 
Notice that before speaking is mentioned here, hearing is talked about. Be swift to hear. The King, King James said, be quick to hear. As, as it's often been pointed out, and, and it's not to suggest that this is some, there's some absolute truth to this, but as some have pointed out, God gave us two ears and, and one mouth because He wanted us to listen twice as much as we talk. I think there's wisdom in that. I'm not suggesting that's the reason why God created us the way that he did as far as our ears and mouth. But nevertheless, it causes us to think, doesn't it? I need to be more apt to listen before I speak. And this idea of being slow to speak before I'm just going to go ahead and utter whatever's in my mind it causes us to really have to try to discipline ourselves. Also, there's the warning in James 1.26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So now we've got what we say tied to our very Christianity and the way that we're trying to live as Christians because the Bible tells us that if we're not careful with our tongues, it can cause our Christianity to be useless. So it gets really serious when you talk about those kinds of things. And then, if that isn't enough, you think about what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The late brother Wendell Winkler used to say, if you have trouble with your words, take yourself to the judgment. In other words, picture yourself before God in the judgment day in your mind's eye and with all the words that you have said throughout your life. <clears throat> How does that make you feel about your speech? Does that make you feel uncomfortable? And so, as Brother Winkler would say, you know, picturing yourself at the judgment should help us clean up our language. And so, when, you think about, when we think about the Christian speech and the way we are to talk, we observe that I need to consider my speech in relationship to the Bible's warnings. In the second place, I need to consider my speech in relationship to God. I need to consider my speech in relationship to God. And there are two main questions we want to ask in relationship to this point. Number one, what do I say about God and what do I say to God? What do I say about God and what do I say to God? Well, what do I say about God? That's important. Well, I need to speak about God in a respectful way. In Psalm 111 and verse 9, the Bible says he has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. And then this statement is made, holy and awesome is his name. The old King James said, holy and reverend is his name. And in fact, the only time the word reverend is ever used in the Bible by any translation is found in Psalm 111 verse 9. And it's not in reference to a man as a reverend, but rather that word is only ever used in reference to God. Holy and reverend is his name. In other words, his name is to be revered. His name is to be respected. In our society, it seems that television and movies and social media really have only one reason to use God's name, and that's to profane it. God's name has become nothing more than a swear word to some folks. And certainly this is something that falls under the idea that Paul talked about of filthy language or filthy communication. We know the Bible warned long ago in Exodus 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Message to the children of Israel about how they need to respect God's name. And so that's why I not only need to speak about God in a respectful way, as the Bible tells me, but I need to avoid speaking about God in an unholy way. I need to avoid speaking about God in an unholy way. I don't want to speak about Him in a way that's not 
in accordance with His holiness. Think about what Jesus said when He was teaching His disciples to pray in Matthew 6 and verse 9. He said, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. That word hallowed means to be held in reverence. And yet often we hear people say out of surprise, Oh my! And then they'll fill in that last part with God. God's name. And so there's not a lot of respect in just idly shouting out some exclamation and saying those words. But, you know, it goes a little bit deeper than that because society has tried to maybe accommodate some of us that would be offended by using that phrase. And so they'll, so for, for many years, for very many, many years, as a matter of fact, in order to accommodate those of us who would be offended... In society, they've tried to substitute the word God for something else. I wasn't ever introduced to this idea until I went to preaching school and I had an instructor point this out to me. And then I became very heightenedly aware of this. But think about, for example, the word gosh. People say that all the time. You know, the first recorded instance of that was in the 1700s, 1750, and 60. And so if you look up these words in the dictionary, it's very revealing. It's a euphemistic alteration of God. So you know that when people, uh, you know, may not realize when they say that word that society has said, well, you know, that's really, we're trying to say God, but we just don't want to, we want to soften it a little bit so we don't, you know, offend anybody. People say, oh my, and then they'll insert the word goodness there. You look that up in the dictionary. It's also a euphemism for God in mild expletives. So these are all dictionary definitions of this term. I didn't come up with this. And so again, I had an instructor at preaching school point this out to me. I thought, wow, that's, that's very interesting. I want to be careful not to send a message that I'm trying to use God's name in vain, even though it's not actually the word God. As a Christian, I want to try my best to be very careful with my speech. I've had folks come up to me after talking about this in sermons before and say, wow, you know, I, I didn't realize I was doing that. You know, I've, I've been working on that. And it is a challenge. Be careful with our speech. And so it's a habit that we have to work on. And we have to be careful with. And so when you look at those words, you'll find that you'll have a definition similar to that. Words like gosh or goodness or golly. All of those, when you look them up, they are a euphemism for God. Uh, you know, I used to watch some of the reruns of Leave it to Beaver. And all the time I would hear... Uh, I would hear the bees say, gee, and then you'd say, Wally, you know, talking to his brother, Wally. It's amazing how this has just permeated our culture. The words G and G whiz are euphemisms for Jesus when you look them up in the dictionary. And so a couple of things that we need to keep in mind about English dictionaries. Who writes dictionaries? Do, does the world write them or do Christians write them? Well, obviously the world writes them. And also, another thing is, what's the purpose behind dictionaries? It's not really to give us a very, you know, studied and educated definition of a word. It's really to report how people are using these words in our culture. And so when we go to the dictionary and we see these definitions uh, for gosh and goodness and golly and gee and gee whiz, and we look all those up, we're, what, what the dictionary is telling us is that this is what people are meaning to say in the world. So we have to be careful, just in case you're interested for the definition of euphemism. A euphemism is the substitution of a mild, indirect, or vague expression for one thought to be offensive, harsh, or blunt. So when we talk about challenging ourselves as Christians to be mindful of our speech, we need to be careful in what we say about God. And then number two, we need, to say, we need to be careful in what I say to God. What do I say to God? And obviously this is in the area of my prayer life. You know, when we pray, we need to be mindful of what we're saying to God. Mindful of His Word. Mindful of His will. And so prayer should come from careful consideration of what we're saying. When we stand up 
gentlemen to pray in the assembly. We need to be mindful of what we're saying and praying uh, what we're praying. We need to be thoughtful about God's will, not to suggest we aren't being that way, but just, again, we, we want to do that as, folk, as men who stand up and try to pray properly before God in the presence of all. Because we have to remind ourselves, of course, as he, the Hebrews writer did in Hebrews 4.16, we are coming boldly to the throne of grace. I remember hearing another Bible professor of mine, Fred Harlan, say, you know, every time he prayed, he imagined himself in his mind as standing before the very throne of God. Not to know exactly what that looks like because we don't know. But he tried to picture himself in that way so that he could be very careful and thoughtful about his prayers to God. And so let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we're coming before the throne room of God, so to speak, when we come to him in prayer. And so prayer should come from careful consideration of our words. And also prayer should be in harmony with the revealed will of God. You know, in 1 John 5, verse 14, John says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything, notice this phrase, according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. You know, when you think about the idea he mentions there and asking according to His will, we know that what that means is I have to study the Bible to understand what God's will is. For me as a Christian. And so there are things that are revealed to us that we know what God's will is. And then when we pray, the things that haven't been revealed to us in His will, you know, it, are we going to be given another day to live? Are we going to go somewhere uh, next year and buy and sell and get gain, as James talks about? We don't know that. So we always pray, Lord, if it be Your will, we shall live and do this or that. Again, as James tells us in James 4. And so we understand God's will according to His Word, and we want to pray in accordance with that will. And then anything that hasn't been revealed in His will directly, we pray, if it be your will, let this or that take place. So just some things that we might do well to consider in my speech in relationship to God. What do I say about God? And what do I say to God? And then in the third and final place, when it comes to speaking like a Christian, I need to consider my speech in relationship to others. I need to consider my speech in relationship to others. I need to ask myself the question, are the things that I say to others consistent with what a Christian says as revealed in the Bible? In Ephesians 4.29, again, we're reminded, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but that which is necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now that's a tall challenge, because he says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Not at any time. And we know that we still say things that we shouldn't say, and so we know we have to go to God often and ask for forgiveness, but, it, but also we need to go to others. When we say things that we shouldn't say, go to them and ask for forgiveness. Now Paul gives a contrast in this verse. Instead of the kind of speech that will tear someone down, that would be the corrupt word that would proceed out of my mouth. Instead of that, he says, I need to say words that are good for edification, that is building others up. So I don't want to tear people down when I speak. I want to do my best as a Christian to build people up when I speak. And so use the kind of speech that builds up, that edifies, that ministers grace or imparts grace to the hearers. So I have to ask myself, is the kind of speech that I'm using as a Christian on a regular, ongoing basis, is it the kind of speech that encourages others or discourages others. Gossip, slander are problems in our society, but also in the church as well. And Christians, we must be the ones to set the example for others to follow. We don't want to follow the line and the speech of the world. We want to set the example. 
And so if I'm going to talk about someone, may it be only good things that I say about them. May I be mindful of building them up in the eyes of others and not tearing others down in, in, in front of others. And if I have ill feelings towards someone, in other words, if there's a problem between me and someone, well, doesn't the Bible address that issue as well? As Jesus said in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, some people read that to say, go and tell everybody else about it so that they'll be on your side. No, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. No one else needs to know about that. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. One of the things I always strive to do when someone comes and talks to me and they start to talk about somebody else, I try to stop them if I can and say, hold on, did you go and talk to them? Did you go and talk to them about this problem? Because I don't need to hear anything about this. This is none of my business. This is a problem between you and that person, and I don't need to know about it, and nobody else needs to know about it. All you need to do is go and talk to that person and try to get things right, because when you do that, you solve the problem. When you talk about them, you make the problem bigger and bigger and bigger, and you cause destruction of the reputation and so forth. So we need to be careful in what we say as Christians. Are the things that I say to others consistent with what a Christian says? Is the kind of speech that I use the kind of speech that a Christian uses as the Bible points out? Or is it a tongue gone berserk? Remember, Leviticus 19.16 warned the children of Israel, You shall not go about as a talebearer, that's another word for gossip, among your people. Nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor, I am the Lord. Again, James 1.26 warns us, If anyone thinks himself to be religion and does not bridle his tongue, his religion is useless. So again, I have to be careful with what I say. Are the things that I say to others consistent with what a Christian says? And then right along with that, do I approve of others saying things that are inconsistent with what a Christian says? Do I encourage that? Do I encourage tearing people down? Am I thinking or allowing them to think that I approve of what they say when they say things harmful to others? Think about what Paul said to the Corinthians. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Or as the New American Standard says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You know, the people that I am hanging around with, as we often say, that affects my thinking. It also affects my speech. The influence that they have on me is going to have an impact on my speech, so I need to be careful. You know, it really bothers me to hear people say things I know shouldn't be said. I'm sure it bothers you too. But, you know, what's even worse is when a Christian says those things. You know, I, I know sometimes people, again, going back to this euphemism idea and, and so on. So, you know, one of the words that really, really bothers me to hear Christians say is C-R-A-P. And that's a, that's a euphemism for another word. You know, oh, that really, S-U-C-K-S. -S. Is that really speech that a Christian should be using? The world uses it all the time. But is that something that I should be saying? Is that something good and wholesome? As the Bible says, I need to have wholesome words. You think about social media and all the opportunities people have to just really tear people down and use ugly language. Sometimes you'll go to the profile and say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. And then you'll see all this filthy language follow. I'm thinking, how does that, how does that harmonize? With what it means to be a Christian. But then at the end of the day, the ultimate question I need to ask myself is, are these words that Jesus would use? Are these the kinds of things that Jesus would say? And if I'm someone who's striving to follow him and live like him more and more, if he wouldn't say those things, then who am I to say those things? Remember, in Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ 
liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm supposed to be dead to the world and dead to self and live like Jesus. Likewise, we as Christians, not only do we look out for ourselves, but do we take the time to warn those whom we care about and what they're saying, if it's inconsistent with what a Christian says. I would want someone to tell me if I'm using offensive words. If they love me, they will. Because I want to go to heaven. And I want to help others get there too. And so yes, the Christian life is a challenging life in many ways. Especially in the area of what we say. But if we're going to be pleasing to God, then we must make the effort to be very careful with our words, as the Bible reminds us many times. May our prayer be to God, much like David prayed in Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. May our words be with grace, seasoned with salt. We need to be speaking like a Christian. But you know, if I'm not a Christian, it wouldn't make sense for me to do anything like a Christian. But if I want to go to heaven, then I understand that I have to become a Christian and do my best to live like a Christian. Becoming a Christian involves me believing Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. Repenting of my sins, Acts 17, 30. Confessing, those are some wonderful words to use. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 37, wonderful words. And then be baptized, immersed into water for the forgiveness of my sins. Acts 22, 16, Acts 2, 38. And then I have to live like a Christian. I need to strive to be faithful till death. But now I might receive the crown of life, as Jesus said to the church at Smyrna in Revelation 2.10. Living faithful unto death doesn't mean I'll never say anything I shouldn't say. I'll never think anything I shouldn't think. Or I'll never do anything that I shouldn't do. No, I can't arrive at that position in my life where I've completely gotten sin away from me to where I'll never sin again. But faithfulness, as we know, means that when there is sin in my life, when I do say something I shouldn't say or think something I shouldn't think or do something I shouldn't do, I repent of that. I'm sorry, Lord. I should have done that. And I confess that, verse John 1, 9, so I can be forgiven. So this morning, if you're subject to the invitation of our Lord and we can help you obey Him, would you make that known as we stand and sing this invitation song? <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have 